to the ultimate search. I want to welcome everybody who's here in the room with me and also all who are watching online. I'm excited to bring to you the message that we have for today. I'm not excited this sermon series is over, but I'm excited for what God has spoken to us over the last few weeks in our exploration of the ultimate search. We've learned how to go to the Bible for the ultimate search, for ultimate truth. We learned the SOAP method, scripture, observation, application, and prayer. We've learned about inviting the Holy Spirit to be a part of that process because he will speak to us through the Word of God. He will show us Jesus' teachings. He will show us the Father. He'll show us the Son. And what we want to talk about today is what we do with it. Once we have gone through the ultimate search and we've heard from God, what are we going to do with it? Jesus likened hearing his word and putting it to practice to building a house that's going to stand. And really, that's what we want. Those of us who are parents, we want a home that will stand, that no matter what happens, we will stand. And so we're going to look at the way Jesus wrapped up the Sermon on the Mount as we wrap up this sermon series, looking at Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. This is Jesus wrapping up the most famous sermon ever preached. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And so Jesus ended his sermon, and Matthew concludes in verses 28 and 29, when Jesus finished, had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. While Lisa and I were on vacation recently, we went to a farmer's market. That's one thing Lisa always likes to do, go to a farmer's market, maybe have breakfast there, and they had a lot of food trucks and food stands, and we decided that we were going to have chilaquiles for breakfast. Anybody know what chilaquiles are? Yeah, wonderful breakfast. You should try it sometime. Plenty of uh, opportunities to find those in the Norristown area, I assure you. And uh, while we were waiting for our chilaquiles to be prepared, we were engaging the family operating the stand and asked questions like, you know, how long have you guys been doing this? And, you know, the dad explained that, you know, they had just started a couple of years before and it was kind of a weekend thing that they did and went to various, you know, uh, fairgrounds and food festivals and farmers markets and things like that. And things are going pretty well, especially, you know, since travel's back and, uh, their son, who was probably about 12 or 13 years old, got pretty excited as he was listening to his dad talking about how well the business was doing, and the son just interjected proudly exclaiming, yeah, one day we made $3,000. And I could tell the dad was a little bit embarrassed, <laughs> uh, but I, I just remembered commenting something like, well, it sounds like you bring him in on the family business. That's a good thing. And it is a good thing because, you know, the kids are going to pick up on things. And that's the point. Kids pick up on what we invest ourselves in. Kids pick up on our priorities. Uh, they, they, they tend to figure out what is important to us. Our politics, our opinions on various issues, and most important, kids will pick up on our relationship with God. They will pick up on that. And if we're going to build our house on the rock of hearing and obeying Jesus, our kids are going to pick up on that. And that's a good thing. And hopefully they get excited about it because that's more important than, you know, having a food truck or food stand that produces $3,000 in one day. Studies have shown this. 
that concern for what parents think is the number one reason why kids who do not do drugs have never taken them up. They never abuse drugs. Why? Because they're concerned about what their parents think. That's a good thing. And uh, you know, this is true of you, at least the majority of you. Your uh, political positions, whether you like it or not, tend to align with your parents' political positions. I know you can find exceptions to that, but that's the general rule. Like the commercial says, we can't protect you from becoming your parents. <laughs> we can't protect you from becoming your parents. You, you, you're going to do it. You don't want to, but you do. And the same applies to our own kids. And you know, we hear a lot of things in the church world in recent years about how, you know, the church is losing the younger generation, and, you know, that is true. There is a falling away, and that's very, very concerning, but at the same time, it's, it's been shown that, you know, the thing that is most likely to determine whether a child or a young person will continue to follow the Lord has a whole lot to do with their parents' faith. It's still true. And maybe there's a big falling away of young people because there's a bigger falling away of us older people who maybe some in our generation do not take our relationship with the Lord seriously enough because kids are going to follow us for the most part. I know there are exceptions, but this is talking about the general rule. Kids are going to follow the faith of their parents. And I read a statistic just about three or four weeks ago that said, you know, that the father, even more than the mother, has tremendous influence on the faith development of the children. Now, we honor mothers here at Victory Church. We honor women in ministry. We honor single mothers. And we recognize that we have many families led by a single mom who is doing an incredible job, and we affirm that. But, you know, the, the fact remains that when there's a father who has tremendous faith, it's even more likely that that will be passed on. So, fathers... We have a job to do, and it's not even Father's Day. But I, I think that's a great statistic. In fact, you know, if you talk to my family, my two daughters who are serving the Lord, uh, chances are, you know, and I, I agree with this, that my daughter's faith has more to do with their mother's parenting skills than with mine. But ever since that statistic came out, I'm thinking, you've got to give me more credit. At least I didn't run them away completely from the faith. They are serving the Lord. But parents, parents have tremendous influence. We, this week, have had kids camp, and it's been great. But, you know, the church doing children's ministry, kids camp, whatever, uh, just our influence is minimal compared to the influence of parents. And, you know, I, I know you want to build a house that will stand. And, you know, thinking about your kids, your family, your, your, your own life, if you don't have kids yet, you want a house that's going to stand. As Joshua was coming to the end of his life, he had led Israel for many years after Moses had died, and he laid out before Israel a choice. You know, you can serve the Lord who delivered you from slavery in Egypt, or you can serve the gods that your ancestors served and the gods that the pagan nations around you served. What is it going to be? Which are you going to choose? And then he said in Joshua 24, 15, the last part of that verse, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And I think that's a wonderful declaration for any father or mother to make with regard to their family. Now, I know, I know this. We're in a modern time. Things have changed, and it kind of works against our modern minds to think about this patriarchal, patriarchal concept that a male head of the household would just decree, we're going to serve the Lord. That doesn't quite fit our culture, does it? Can I just say this? Because I, I think this is a reality. 
A mere decree was never enough, and it didn't even work back then. It's not enough today for you to, we're going to serve the Lord. And it wasn't enough for Joshua. Notice he, he, he didn't just say, my family's going to serve the Lord. He said, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And that as for me part is absolutely essential, absolutely vital if we are to have a family that serves the Lord and is going to be able to receive the blessings, the benefits of following God and you know, to produce a household that is going to stand when the storms come. As for me, that part has to be in place before the and my house part. Is it in place in our own households, in our own lives, whatever our family status? And this ties in with the parable that Jesus tells. The wise man whose house stands is not the man who issued a decree, is it? It's not just the man who made a decision, even though I'm sure there was a decision made at some point in his life. The wise man who builds his house on the rock, according to the parable that we read, is the one who hears God's word and then does what? What did Jesus say? Puts it into practice. Puts it into practice. This is not just a decree. A decree by itself will not work if we're going to have a strong house if we're going to have whatever that house represents, if we're going to have a strong life, a blessed life, we have to be a people who put God's word into practice. Now, that's an obvious benefit, right? A house that stands, a house that can endure, a house that won't fall. That's wonderful. It's a great benefit, and we should believe for that. We should trust God that his promise in that regard is yes, Amen. Your house will stand. Hallelujah. But we also have to take note that in this parable, the storm still comes. The storm still came against the wise man's house. The rains came. The stream rose. The winds blew and beat on that house. But it stood. I think it's very important for us to recognize, though, the storms will come. In fact, verses 25 and 27, one describing the wise man's house, one describing the foolish man's house, have exactly the same words. In other words, we can be very wise, but there's something that we have in common with the very foolish, and that is that the storm comes. Those words that are, are there in Scripture in verses 25 and 27 are the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Some of you know members of our church, Daphne and Sylvester, and, and they're just wonderful people. And over the last several months, they've gone through an inexplicable season of loss with a number of family members having gone on to be with the Lord, having died. It includes, includes one of their parents, two of their siblings, if not three. And it all began in July of last year, a year ago this month, with the horrible, horrible death of their 43-year-old son in a tragic auto accident. And, man, you know, just one death after another, just tremendous pain, as you could imagine. And... They've turned to the Lord for help and for comfort, and they found it. If you know them, you know they have found the peace of God. But the, the onslaught of tragedy after tragedy certainly did raise some questions in their, their minds, and they gave me permission to share this. And I remember standing out in the lobby of this church, and Sylvester came, and, and his wife Daphne was standing there, and you know, I spoke some words to them that hopefully were encouraging. And I remember just Sylvester's face, and you could see the pain in it, and you could hear even, you know, a, a, a choking voice just with sadness. And he said, Pastor, I have to ask you something. Is God mad at us? 
Was God mad at us? It's a normal question. It's a reasonable question for us to ask. But I could tell them, I could tell you, no, that didn't happen because God's mad at you. None of that happened because God is mad at you. I have absolutely, does God get mad at things and people? I'm sure he does. But I could say unequivocally, Sylvester, Daphne, God is not mad at you. I could say that to anybody in this room. God is not mad at you. I could say that to you who are watching right now. God is not mad at you. His love is so much greater than his anger, even if you were mad at us. But those things don't happen because God's mad at us. The other question that I have heard many, many times over my years of ministry, when somebody's facing the storm, the question is this, Pastor, what did I do wrong that this happened to me? And I think most of the time, the answer is, you didn't do anything wrong. The fact is, we live in a world where Satan's still loose. It's still a fallen world. Bad things happen in this world. And being a follower of Christ doesn't mean the storm doesn't come. Storms come. We, we, we as Christians, need to understand that you know, there's not some kind of formula where if we do everything exactly right, we'll never experience a storm. That is not the reality of this world that we're living in right now. God's kingdom is coming. His kingdom is advancing. We're praying every day, Lord, let your will be done on earth as in heaven. But until Jesus comes back and we go to be with the Lord in heaven, then bad things are still going to happen. Yeah, I know. I, I do know this. We sometimes experience disaster from making some bad decisions. Isn't that true? We've all suffered the consequences of some bad decisions at some point or another in our lives. I, I know that, but that's not what we're talking about. You can make all the right decisions, though, and still end up in a threatening storm. You can be, as the wise man, putting Jesus' words into practice. You can be wise and doing what you know that God has told you to do, and the rains will come. The streams will rise. The winds will blow and beat against what you've done. But here's the thing. It will endure. It will endure. Your house will stand. Your house will stand. We're not immune from all those things, but our house will stand. COVID affected everybody. If you were impacted by COVID, it's not like, what did you do wrong? That, you know, you weren't totally protected from that situation, whether we're talking about the disease or some of the ramifications. The Great Recession probably affected all of us. All families will know the loss of a loved one. That's just going to happen. We all face grief of one kind or another. We all have to deal sometimes with the hard slog of just pushing through a challenging season, a painful season. We all are going to experience that. But here's the thing. We don't have to crumble in the face of opposition. Our house will stand in the storm. And this is the lesson of Jesus' parable. And this is the experience and the testimony and the witness of Daphne and Sylvester. They are standing. And many other families right here with us are standing in some tough times. You know, there, there are families in this room right now who look like they've never faced a challenge in their lives. Some, some of you look like you've never had a problem in all your life. You just, you're so happy and wonderful. You can see the peace of God on your faces. You've given expression to the joy of the Lord in our worship time. Wow! And, you know, there can be people sitting in this same room and look across at, at you or at such a person and think, wow, they could never relate to what I'm going through. They've never had a problem in their lives. The thing is, we don't know what they've been through. We don't know what they've had to endure. We don't know the pain that they had to go through, maybe even to come to a worship service. What they had to push through to say, 
as for me in my house, or as for my life, I'm going to worship God. I'm going to worship him. They're not immune from the storms. I mean, some, some people that you just look at and think, wow, they're just the happiest, most cheerful, most peaceful, peaceful Christian I've ever met. You wouldn't believe what some have gone through to get to this point in their lives and their walk with the Lord. And the reason is they've learned that, yeah, the storm's going to come, but my house is going to stand. Amen? Amen. See, following Jesus is not about trouble avoidance. <laughs> following Jesus is way more about trouble endurance. We're not going to avoid everything, but we can endure everything. Folks, we will not be defeated. We will not be overcome. Our house will not fall. It will stand no matter what comes. <laughs> the house built on the rock stood firm. The house built by the wise man as an example of hearing the word of God and putting the word of God into practice is going to stand. Hallelujah. I wish that were the end of my sermon. Hallelujah. You're going to stand. The only thing is, it's not the end of Jesus' sermon. I wish he had just stopped right there. That, doesn't Jesus know that you need to wrap up a sermon, you know, by uh, building up kind of this emotional high, and we like, yes, we're going to stand, we're going to do it. Doesn't Jesus know that that's how you want to end a sermon? Who am I to teach Jesus how to do a sermon, though? I mean, I want to learn from him. Right? And, you know, our culture, what we like, what we love, we don't watch TV preachers to have them, you know, tell us something negative. We want to hear, and they lived happily ever after. That's our cultural way of, of telling a story. That's the way you're supposed to wrap up. Emily's an English major, right? Happily ever after. It's the way you do it. But not Jesus. That's not the way he ends. Man, this... Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, three chapters, the greatest sermon ever, all this, you know, nice stuff about, you know, blessed are the, the meek, and, you know, all this wonderful, you know, just warm, fuzzy kind of stuff. And then he wraps up by talking about a foolish builder who experienced total destruction. And that's how he ends the sermon. Matthew 7, 27. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house. And it fell with a great crash. I mean, I, I, I can just maybe see or hear Jesus speaking very emphatically. The language that he's using here is very descriptive and it's very strong. It wasn't wimpy. It wasn't weak in any way. He's trying to make the point here. The rains are going to come. The streams will rise. The wind will blow. They will beat against whatever you built. And if you built like this foolish guy, it's going to fall. And it's not just going to fall a little bit. The crash will be great. Amen in the sermon. Wow. Think about this. The, both the wise and the foolish builders had something in common. Number one, and I didn't think of this, my wife did. I said, Do you know what they had in common? And my wife said, They both built houses. Yeah, but that's not the one I was going to say. They, they both were builders. That's a good observation. They both built houses. And they might have. Built very well, except for the foundation. They both applied themselves to building their homes. And sometimes, we, especially in America, I think, we, we just act like if, if we're just trying, we're just trying, we just, we, you know, at least we're building, at least we're doing something, and at least we're not just sitting around twiddling our thumbs. At least I'm, I'm building. You know, you got to respect that. Just building away. Doesn't matter the foundation. Doesn't matter what you use. You know, the, the important thing, you know, bless you, brother, you're just building. Go for it. Lots of possible foundations. Yeah, you don't, you, don't have to, you don't have to build the same foundation that somebody else does. As long as you're building. Isn't that the way we look at it? 
Not the way Jesus looked at it, though. The other thing they had in common that we've already talked about, storm came upon both of their houses. But here's the most important commonality. Hear this. The most important thing the wise and foolish builders had in common. You know what it is? They both heard the teachings of Jesus. They both heard. So what's the big difference? What's the big difference? What is it that determines after having heard the word of the Lord whether or not they were like the wise man or the foolish? Whether or not what they were applying themselves to would withstand the storm or would fall with a great crash in the storm? What's the difference? The difference is what they did with the teaching. What they did with it. It reminds me of Dr. Larry LaCour. He was mine and Lisa's preaching professor when we were at Oral Roberts University Seminary. And wonderful preacher, just powerful preacher, United Methodist guy. So, you know, not, not a, a crazy charismatic Pentecostal preacher necessarily, but man, he could preach the word of God. and Just, man, grip your heart with it. And I remember one class session, he was giving us an example of his sermon, give us maybe a, a five-minute sampler of his sermon. It was just very captivating. And at the end of laying out this scriptural gospel truth, he said, and I'll never forget this, well, there it is, what are you going to do with it? There it is, what are you going to do with it? And I think that's a good way to approach even this message. There it is. What are you going to do with it? And your response to that determines whether or not we're in the wise category or the foolish. This is not my words. This is what Jesus is talking about here. And that's the big difference. We have to put it into practice. We have to put it into practice. The consequences of not putting the teaching of Jesus into practice is that there will be destruction. There will be chaos. There's going to be a storm either way. But whether there's destruction and chaos depends on what are we going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? And so Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount. Wow. That's kind of anticlimactic. But then Matthew, the last two verses of Matthew chapter 7, he gives us a little bit of a commentary. So Jesus' sermon's over. It fell with a mighty crash. Boom. What are you going to do with this story? And Matthew says in verses 28 and 29 as he wraps up, when Jesus had finished, these, finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Why? Because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. See, what, what, what's the question here? Is he going to be embraced as your authority? Or is he not? You ever go to somebody for counsel? And they gave you wise counsel? But at the time, you didn't consider it wise and you just dismissed it and didn't do it? You probably paid a price, right? So we have the teachings of Jesus in Scripture. What are we going to do with it? We have to decide whether or not to accept Jesus' authority. We have to decide whether or not to accept the authority of his word. We have to decide whether or not to accept the authority of the Bible, which Jesus said about himself that all of Scripture points to him. Are we going to accept it? Are we going to accept it? Now, some scholars teach that, well, the storms represent the storms of life. Other scholars say, no, they, those storms don't represent the storms of life. The storm and the fall of the house represents the final judgment. You know what I think it is? Both and. Because we're going to face storms in this life. And if we're not following Jesus, there's going to be a greater difficulty, a greater degree of difficulty when we face those storms. And those of us who are following Jesus, we go through storms and we know that we're going to endure. But here's the thing, on either side, 
we know there are eternal ramifications for what we do with what Jesus teaches. And the bottom line is, do we accept Jesus as our authority? And the basic proclamation of the early church is simply this, Jesus is Lord. He is Lord. He, he has authority that goes far beyond any human authority. The question is, are we going to embrace that teaching and follow it? Are we going to accept Jesus for who he is? And here's what he said, if you accept me for who I am, here's, here's the thing, believe in me. Believe that he is the son of God who died on the cross for our sins. Believe that he was raised from the dead. Believe that he ascended into heaven. Believe that he's returning in glory. Put your trust in him. And then follow him, obey him. See, we're not saved by building a great house on a good foundation. We're saved by our faith in Jesus Christ. That's the first aspect of really doing what Jesus said, putting our life in his hands. It's the first step. And I want to urge you today because it's not just about the storms of this life. It's about eternity. Who is this teacher to you? Does he have authority in your life? If not yet, would you, would you give it to him? Would you say yes to Jesus, who he is and what he's done? today. Now's your time. If you're watching online and you have never given your life to Christ, right now's your time. If you're here in the room with me and you've never done that before, now is your time. Would you say yes to Jesus? Would you let him be your authority? You know what? As you then begin to follow him, storms are going to come, but you will not crumble. Your house will stand. Would you put your faith in him right now? I want to ask everybody who's here with me and everybody who's watching online, pray this from your heart. If you've never received Christ, make it your own prayer as you repeat my words. And if you're here, pray it out loud to encourage those who need to pray it for the first time and to just affirm your own faith. Say these words, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love. I believe Jesus died. He was raised from the dead. And he is Lord. Forgive me of all my sins. Be the Lord of my life. I submit my life to you, Jesus. Fill me with your spirit. Help me live for you. Speak to me through your word. I'm listening. And I'll respond. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give a clap to the Lord for those who made a decision. Welcome to the family of God. If you made that decision, that is the greatest decision you've ever made in your life. Somebody's going to come and share with you some very important next steps. Let me tell you, the enemy of your soul doesn't like that you made a decision for Christ. He wants to steal the word from you. So stay with us and communicate with us so we can stand with you. God has great things in store for you.